Hello and welcome to the December 14th Virginia Opioid Abatement Authority Abatement Academy. My name is Jennifer Nelson, Virginia Institute of Government Assistant Director for Membership and Engagement. The Virginia Institute of Government is the leadership development and community engagement arm of the Weldon Cooper Center for Public Service at the University of Virginia. Through our research, leadership development programs, and local government engagement initiatives, we continue to work towards our vision of good governance, equity, and resilience in every Virginia community. VIG offers leadership development through SEI and LEAD, local government equity clinics, certification for treasurers and commissioners of the revenue, and customized training programs. State agencies and local governments can access a range of consultation and support services to build more resilient organizations. We have a team of seasoned public sector leaders and subject matter experts ready and available to facilitate boards of supervisors, city and town councils, leadership team strategic planning retreats, and other related events. Today, VIG is glad to partner with the Opioid Abatement Authority for the final Abatement Academy session for 2023. A few housekeeping notes. This session is being recorded and will be posted on the Weldon Cooper Center for Public Service YouTube channel soon. If you have any questions, please type them in the chat and I will ask them for you at the end of the session. Thanks again for taking the time to join us today for this Abatement Academy session. Now I'm happy to turn things over to Tony McDowell, the Authority's Executive Director. Tony? Thanks, Jennifer, and happy holidays, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, in just a moment, I'll be introducing our speaker for today, but I'd like to um, thank all of our attendees who've been participating in the Abatement Academy webinar series. We, uh, The Opioid Abatement Authority launched this series back in the spring um, in an effort to provide general information, background, um, best practices that can be used by local governments and by other organizations in the battle against the opioid crisis in Virginia. And we've had, uh, I'm very pleased to announce we've had over 1,700 registered attendees for uh, the 13 sessions that we've completed. Today's uh, is the last one of the year, the 14th session. And so we think that between the online views the um, and people viewing the recordings, we're going to have over 2,000 impressions. And so um, thank you for participating, and I hope that you found some value and use in this series. We are right now thinking about what the series can look like in 2024, so stay tuned for more information. Um, this morning, we have a, a speaker with us, who, um, Allie Burrell, and Allie is with the uh, Office of National Drug Control and Policy, specifically the High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area Program that's part of that office. And um, a, a key component of HIDA is the OD map application. This is a resource that um, Virginia can use to track overdoses, both fatal and non-fatal, in real time. And it provides an amazing insight to trends, to spikes, clusters, and gives us an opportunity as a state and all the way down at the local level to use data and to, to, uh, to um, get insights on where overdoses are occurring, where drugs are moving to, and to uh, become aware of uh, dangerous batches, uh, poisoned batches, things of that nature. And uh, this application is being used more and more across the country by different states as part of an effort to target um, outreach, uh, harm reduction, and treatment programs. And so Allie has done a great job as program manager in the, in the Washington, Baltimore area. And we're really pleased that she's able to join us this morning, Allie. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thanks very much. Great, thank you, Tony, and thank you for inviting us to be part of the Academy. Um, so, hi everyone, my name is Allie Burrell, and uh, I'm gonna be talking to you about ODMAP today. I'm the ODMAP Program Manager, as Tony introduced, uh, out of the Washington Baltimore HIDA, which is the High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area. Uh, we are a group that works with partners across the country, uh, specifically with an ODMAP to better understand trends, uh, where overdoses are occurring in near real time, and then be able to provide guidance on uh, data to action on what you can do with that information that's provided. Um, because this is being recorded, I'm not gonna show any live data. So any information that you hear today um, related to mapping activities is going to be reflective of uh, events that have not occurred. It's all dummy data. So just wanna preface that, but the actual site itself does run on live data. 
Um, I'm also going to go off video for my presentation, but I'll hop back on when uh, Jennifer helps facilitate questions at the end. But please feel free to jump in and ask questions in the chat so we can make sure that we address them at the very end. I'll go ahead and get started. Um, so, I, I mean, we're all here because unfortunately we know that there continues to be a rise both in overdoses about a, uh, across the board throughout the United States, especially though related to fentanyl. Um, the rise in fentanyl uh, overdose deaths and overdoses was what led to the development of ODMAP back in 2017. Uh, we know, unfortunately, that this has continued to grow and we're looking at around 110,000 overdose deaths uh, in 2022 and more than that in 2023. So it continues to adapt over time as well. We've seen it transition from an opioid uh, pill-based epidemic to a heroin epidemic and then into a fentanyl and looking as we continue to see that change over time in uh, front of our own eyes. Um, all of this is happening because it's all happening in real time. Um, we have to make sure that we're staying ahead of things and understanding things as it's happening so we can better adapt our uh, information and data sharing practices to ideally prevent the number of overdoses from increasing and make sure we're providing those life-saving resources and programs um, to everyone across the country. And so we realized that at the Washington Baltimore HIDA, um, that public health data and solutions cannot solve the current epidemic alone. Our public safety data and solutions cannot solve the current epidemic alone. Retroactive data alone cannot save and uh, cannot drive life-saving decisions, and that we need to focus on collaboration and real-time data to better understand what's going on in the now so that we can prevent and reduce overdoses in the future. So what is ODMAP? ODMAP is a free web-based tool that provides near real-time surveillance of suspected overdose events to support public safety and public health efforts to mobilize immediate response to overdose events. So you're gonna hear a lot of uh, real-time, immediate response. A lot of these will continue to um, appear throughout the presentation. And that's because within our space at the WB HIDA, that's really where we focus on is that immediate response. We understand that there are a lot of really amazing tools, both at the local, state, and federal levels that focus on uh, syndromic surveillance. Um, our space is really that within that immediate time frame of an overdose. So within the 28 to 48 hours after an individual's overdose, that's really where we want to gather our information from. So you'll hear a lot of those buzzwords consistently throughout this presentation. So ODMAP first started back in 2016. We launched a three county pilot out of our uh, out of West Virginia um, because the Washington Baltimore's areas area of responsibility is going to be is uh, Washington, uh, Washington DC, West Virginia, Virginia, and um, Maryland. And so we started there uh, in response to what we were seeing in Baltimore. So we gathered everyone together. They uh, expressed the need for this kind of real time data sharing. And our director said, you know, we have an opportunity to be that conduit to facilitate um, data sharing as well as develop a program. And that's where ODMAP started was those three counties in West Virginia. And it's grown from there. So as of last month, we have an agency signed up in all 50 states, as well as the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico. We have approximately 4,800 agencies that have uh, signed our participation agreement. And then we have approximately 32,000 users uh, that have signed up over uh, that time period since 2017. We have 35 states, and that includes the state of Virginia, uh, with a statewide implementation strategy. And that can either be legislation that supports or requires reporting of overdoses to ODMAP. It can be a statewide data entry practice. Um, we have two folks in Wyoming who hand enter every data point uh, of overdoses that occur in the state. So we count that as a statewide strategy. And then we have our um, kind of uh, most prevalent one is our statewide application programming interfaces, um, which for Virginia pushes all non, uh, for Virginia particularly, we work with the Office of EMS and they push all non-fatal overdose event information. So any non-fatal overdose event that is seen by EMS, that information is automatically populated into ODMAP. And we have 25 states that are providing that same type of information, a direct connection with their system. Um, it really helps making sure that information is usually sent over to us within six hours. Um, and I'll explain why that timing is really crucial to some of our tools here in a little bit. Um, but Virginia does make that data available through our partnership with the Office of EMS, as well as a lot of our neighboring states as well. So we have statewide data in uh, Maryland, in Delaware, in District of Columbia, in West Virginia, um, we have it two different streams in Kentucky, and then our neighbors down south in Tennessee and uh, North Carolina 
We do have some coverage in the major areas, but unfortunately we're still working on kind of building up that statewide implementation. But we do have 25 others, uh, we have 25 states in total with uh, an application program interface. And all of this equates to having 2.24 million overdose events entered into ODMAP since uh, we collect information back from January 1, 2017. So I'm gonna transition into talking into ODMAP 101. So ODMAP, we really focus on, um, as I mentioned, that real-time space. And so because we do collect information on specific location, it means ODMAP is not meant for the general public. It's really meant for folks at the federal, state, local, and tribal law enforcement, uh, so our public safety and our public health uh, partners. So it can be law enforcement and criminal justice personnel. This includes our medical examiners and coroners, our public health individuals, whether that be at the behavioral health, at the Department of Health, um, and other various different public health entities. Um, it's our licensed first responders, so fire and EMS, hospitals with emergency departments. It does exclude any research units, um, and I'll explain why that, that's a, important here in a minute. And then all agencies, uh, when they apply to become an ODMAP agency, they have to sign a participation agreement, and that it outlines how data can be shared, how we uh, how data, data ownership is maintained by the agency and any other policies and procedures are outlined in there. So everyone knows going in uh, what you can and cannot do with the information. And that is why our research units are uh, excluded is because um, ODMAP does not retain the data or does not retain ownership of the data. The data ownership is retained by the agency themselves. We currently have three different ways that agencies can submit information to ODMAP. Our goal is we know that the folks that are currently collecting this information are at being asked for to submit data to a variety of different agencies already. So our goal is to make sure that if they want to partner with us at ODMAP, that we are providing different ways to meet their needs, to make sure that we're not asking them to enter into another set of data if they don't have to. So we try to meet them where they're at. So our three methods currently are our manual entry form, which is uh, mobile friendly. So you can enter it from a tablet, an iPad, a tablet, a phone, a computer, so any sort of way you can get onto the um, internet, then you can submit it. And that's what that form is here on the left. We have OD form, which is for our specific set of law enforcement. And then we have our application programming interface. OD map is also unique in the fact that because we are not a syndromic surveillance system, we really focus on collecting a limited amount of data and trying to maximize information from that. So OD map only requires four specific data points in order to submit a case into the system. And that's going to be an incident state and time, a location, an outcome, so whether it was a fatal or non-fatal overdose, and then a uh, naloxone administration type. So that we bucket into single dose, multi-dose, administration unknown, and not administered. And agencies can include additional information. Um, it's not required, but we do have fields such as suspected drug, if they were transported to a hospital, if naloxone was left behind, um, if a motor vehicle was involved. Um, there's a couple, there's about 20 other optional data points they can enter, um, age, gender. However, not all of these are going to be presented onto the map. Um, suspected drug here is bolded because out of all of them, this is our one we, if it is possible, recommend the most that people submit to ODMAP because we know that being able to track how trends change um, it's really crucial to how you might implement different strategies. So if you see a if you see a traditional methamphetamine heavy use area transition to a fentanyl, then you want to make sure that you're having enough naloxone to cover for that change, that you're going out and teaching people about different strategies related to Narcan distribution and other harm reduction initiatives, or you're able to go and make sure that the um, uh, learn about, you know, potency and different things of that nature. So we really encourage suspected drug as one that agencies can submit um, if it's possible. This is a little bit more about API, so that application programming interface. It just allows a direct and automated integration. Uh, it really, really focuses on making sure that our agencies uh, do not have to re-enter data into another system. So, for example, your EMS providers are the ones that usually uh, have created a API with us traditionally. And so when they complete their run sheet at the end of a run, if they hit submit on that button and it closes out their case, then that's automatically pushed over into ODMAP. So they don't have to log into a system and re-enter it. It's automatically just pushed over. 
Um, we use a very simple REST uh, API, and that allows us to make sure that we can connect with almost any system. We've not been able to not connect with the system, uh, which is great for us because it really, again, meets people where they're at. Um, and then it's one of those things where once you set it up, it's done, and it's what's called backward compatible. So if there's any changes that are made, it should not impact the um, flow of data uh, at all. And one of the other major questions that we get is related to HIPAA usually, because we do include information on location. Um, however, we're not consistent, considered a system of record. Um, we collect location information, date and time, fatality status, and naloxone. Everything else is considered optional. And our information that is collected is not considered PHI. Um, it's our location information is translated into a latitude and longitude, so a geolocated point and the, where the overdose occurred and none of the other information is retained. We do not keep any address information. It is purely used to geocode and then it's completely deleted from our system because we don't wanna make sure that we don't have any of the information that would be approaching a PHI level. Um, and then and addition, additionally, we also have a Zoom uh, function where it limits to how close you can zoom into a location. So it goes down to street level. Um, and that's to make sure that, especially in our more rural areas, that we are trying to help mask the individual's identity as much as possible by making sure that we can restrict that zoom level. Now I'm going to take a call. Uh, now I'm going to transition into talking about the actual tools and the system itself. So ODMAP, um, of course, we have a map since we are called ODMAP, and that's what we call the national map. Um, it includes information that is cross-jurisdictional and suspected overdose events. So the great thing about ODMAP is that because it is cross-jurisdictional, once you become an approved agency and then a user of the system, you are able to see everything on the national map. You are not restricted just to your location. So if you register that you are in Arlington County um, or Roanoke City, you are not limited to either of those areas. You can look across the state you can even look across the country. Anything that is on the map, it, you are able to see. However, we also provide opportunities to filter data. So you can filter down to areas of interest, areas that are connected to you. Um, you also have the opportunity to turn those into heat maps. And we also have these pre-built in analytical charts that allow you to kind of help uh, turn uh, the information into uh, bar charts and help kind of start to answer questions. Um, and aggregate that information that makes it easy to present. We also have features um, that help agencies better understand when there are increases in overdoses in their area. So we have spike overdose and statewide alerts. Um, these are emails and text messages that just let you know that there is a higher than uh, usual number of overdoses in your area. We also have the ability to make things, uh, make them map your own. So you can add in your own personal data so if you have information on like harm reduction sites or naloxone distribution points, um, if you're law enforcement, maybe you have information on arrests, whatever that might be related to your particular area of interest, as long as it has a latitude and a longitude related to a point, it will upload it for you. And then you can kind of start to use the tool in more of an analytical sense. And we also have the option for you to import your own Esri web layers. So if you have a local mapping system or dashboard, as long as it has an Esri web layer, you can overlay that as well. But Esri also has the, op uh, has the option for um, individuals to share maps that they've made. So you can upload those as well. Those are things such as hospital locations across the country, schools, anything like that, you can then overlay on the map as long as it's published. And one of the other things that is unique about ODMAP is we allow multiple agencies to provide data for the same area. So you can have law enforcement, your local coroner's office, and EMS from a state or your local level all submitting information to ODMAP at the same time for your area, which helps you better understand in totality of what's going on, of overdoses that are seen by individuals. We do understand that uh, you know folks that um, are overdosing at home and revived by Narcan, uh, you might not be able to capture that, but we are able to better understand at least for um, overdoses that are seen by public safety and public health, those will be captured as well. And we have a duplicate detection program in place that looks at every single event entered into ODMAP and double checks to see if they are potentially a duplicate um, to make sure that we're not triple counting areas um, that have multiple different agencies submitting uh, data to ODMAP. 
So I'm going to get into looking at what the tool is. And as I said, um, for today, we're going to use our example data from our test environment. So all of this is dummy data purely made out of uh, the need for uh, PowerPoint presentations. And so when you first log in to the site, you will see the national map. And that's what you see here. Um, it well, you'll see here in this uh, on the map itself, you'll see diamonds and then you'll see circles and then they're going to be color coded. Our diamond shapes here represent fatal overdoses that have occurred. And then our circles represent non-fatal overdose events. They are color coded based on the naloxone administration type. And we have a key built into the system to help remind you of what they all stand for. Um, but you'll see here like red diamonds, those represent fatal overdose events that have uh, that the person did not receive naloxone. And then you'll see the non-fatals. Um, the greens are going to be your single uh, overdose, single, uh, your non-fatal overdoses with a single dose of naloxone. Purples will be multi-dose. Grays are unknown. So we do color code it to help you better understand um, relationships between naloxone and then uh, fatal or non-fatal. When we move down to the bottom left-hand corner of the screen, you'll see your automatically it automatically defaults to the last 24 hours of overdoses submitted to ODMAP. In general, um, we see about 12 to 1300 overdose events entered into the system daily. And so our numbers at the bottom usually hover around 550 to 700 within the last 24 hours. Uh, so it breaks it down into total suspected overdoses, and then it break, uh, further breaks it down into suspected fatal overdose events. And then it does include information on the naloxone administration types. And this will just count it as a binary number. So if there was naloxone administered, then it will count it as one. It doesn't break it out into multi equals two. It's just a single yes, no, oh, there was uh, naloxone was administered to that individual. We also have built-in filters and it helps you uh, be able to do a deep dive into the data that's available. Um, this includes looking at your custom or at date and times, and you can customize this um, to looking at any information across the board that's available to you. You can look at the location. So you can look at zip code, you can look at state, county, um, all of those are available. And then you can look at type of drug. We do have a now a poly substance feature that I'll show you here in a minute. You can also view the map legend here, looking at this layers option. It looks kind of like a stack of pancakes. It's where a lot of our new features are currently being housed in that little drop down that looks like pancakes. You can change the look of the map. So we have several different options, including charted territories, street views, um, any sort of base, base layer made by Esri is an option. You can also then print your map. And then you can, uh, this is where you'd add your own data layers using that little plus. If we move over to the top left-hand corner, this is where we have our built-in analytical charts. So this includes uh, the type. So it looks at whether it is, it's the relationship between fatal, non-fatal and um, naloxone administration type. So it turns those different colors, the diamonds and the circles, and then the colors into a chart, a bar chart. Uh, it has the day of the week, hour of day, by day, by month. You can compare multiple counties and states over a certain time period using a line chart. And we'll just look at that relationship and uh, you can then drag and drop and you know figure out if there is a relationship between your area. And then uh, you know if you know that your drug trafficking route is coming up and down 95, you can look at different areas to see how quickly um, they are increasing uh, before you are increasing, or if you're increasing and then they're increasing later, just to better understand how all of this relates on a timing perspective. Um, then you can also break it down into a grid level. And so that second uh, chart that looks like a chart, little Excel file, that's our chart feature. It outlines all of the uh, cases that you filtered for. It just kind of provides it in a chart view. I will say, however, that is not able to be exported, which is different than our charts. So our charts, which are gonna be those types by day, by hour, et cetera, those are available to be downloaded um, through a, a vector file, an image file, or a CSV file. The CSV files are only going to include aggregate information, but it's a great way to track trends internally or kind of make the, make the information into a different style of chart. So we do make that available for download. And this is an example here of the chart. So this is that overdoses by type. As you can see, they're broken down into the different colors and their relationships. 
So I mentioned here uh, as well, so all of that information that you have uh, included in the map, you can turn into a heat map that then you can print and provide, uh, and then just be able to track where hotspots are occurring or changing over time. So it's an example here in Baltimore. Um, our office is in uh, south Southwest Baltimore, which you'll see here is a giant hotspot because that's where we enter all of our uh, dummy data for. So it just allows you to kind of see how there are hotspots around. So we just provide that option for you to toggle on and off. We also, in the last few months, uh, understanding that trends have changed and polysubstance continues to be a something that is uh, continues to increase. Uh, and then the relationships of different types of drug uh, patterns are changing. So it's no longer just, um, you know, fentanyl and heroin. It's becoming fentanyl and cocaine and uh, fentanyl and methamphetamine. All of that, though, needs to be reported as much as possible. So understanding how all of these uh, different uh, combinations are impacting areas is important because when we look at hot stamp bags coming through your area, you know, you might be able to see that it's... Um, it's methamphetamine mixed with fentanyl. So you want to be able to understand those changes over time um, and be able to use them to better react to things in real time. And so what we now are able to do is you can include information on as many drugs as you would like, and all of those are going to be reported. And then you can also then filter by those combinations. So you have your primary suspected drug and then additional ones. Um, as long as a drug is included in that uh, additional suspected or suspected drug, it will then query for it. That way you can see all of that. And if you look at the column on the uh, right here, hopefully you can see the map. But in the picture on the left, the one, two, three, fourth column, it says additional suspected. You'll see here it lists all of the drugs that were included in that. So it's going to provide an opportunity just separated there by a little semicolon, all of the drugs, as many as you would like. We've also provided recently the opportunity to um, look into areas uh, and their demographics that are related to where overdoses are being reported. So we understand that different um, socioeconomic and different social determinants of health might impact how areas uh, and are impacting their overdose rates. And so we have taken the information provided by the census uh, and partnership with Esri and their demographic summary dashboard and just embedded it into the system. Uh, and so now you can toggle on a layer where if you click on one of the counties, uh, it will outline in green and it will pop up this summary data uh, here on the right-hand side. This is going to be Hartford County, uh, Maryland, but you can then be able to go and see kind of those basic demographic uh, information and then just kind of better understand about what's going on and how it relates to overdoses in an area. And that's available nationally. So that's already embedded within the system. And then we've also understand that not everyone's area of responsibility or area of interest um, is clean cut along uh, you know, county state lines. And we also know that um, uh, overdoses don't just stop within Virginia. Um, and drug traffickers don't just stop at the border. So what we've done is built in a feature now where you can make your own geographic boundary. So think of it like Zillow. So you can now drag and drop um, your mouse and then, sorry, and then be able to create your own custom boundary here. You'll be able to see a hexagon that's kind of awkwardly shaped but this looks around multiple different areas within Baltimore County and Baltimore City and then Anne Arundel County. So that allows us to look at specific areas within geographic boundaries and better understand how that is related. Um, so this is great for areas that have, um, you know, their counties are across, uh, their areas of responsibility are across counties where they um, are looking at a smaller portion of a county. So if you have a big city in your area and you want to try to look at like, um, where the hotspots are, then you can monitor that using this tool, um, or you can create a larger region. It's up to you. It just basically lets you create what we call a geofence. Um, and now you can save that too. So you can now create what we call custom bookmarks, which allows you to not only save any custom geography, so you can keep going back to it, but you can apply filters to it. So you can say, I wanna look at a specific area, um, and I always wanna look at this quarter's worth of data. We can add in filters, um, any of the filters will apply. So you can look at specific drug combinations. You can look at those custom geographies. Uh, you can look at those date ranges, a specific agency, any filter. If you add it in, it's going to save it as that custom bookmark. 
and it allows you to name it and then it will save it for you. And that means you can just keep coming back to it. So if you have um, area, uh, but you can only do one area at a time. So you can't compare two um, separate shapes or anything like that. You have to be just picking that one area. And then also it's now available in your drop down under the national map. You'll see a list of custom bookmarks and it will list all of those that you have here. So if you click on it, it will just automatically go to that next one. So again, a great way to be able to better understand your specific area and dive uh, and, and look at either larger uh, regions or smaller areas that are impacting it. Uh, next one, this also goes into our spec alerts because what we wanted to do was make sure that um, people were able to understand when there were increases uh, in overdoses in their areas using a spike alert. Um, so what our spike alert looks at is the last 90 days worth of data entered into ODMAP in a specific area. So this uh, traditionally was county-based. However, with the new custom bookmark option, you can now uh, create a spike alert for that custom area. So uh, again, a great example is if you have a smaller area within your city. So if you wanted to just look at the um, northeastern side of Richmond, you could create that geographic boundary. You don't have to look at the whole city of Richmond. Um, so then you can go and make a spike for that. But our spike alerts look at the last 90 days worth of data submitted for whatever geographic boundary you've decided. And then if it meet, uh, and then it will consistently look at that. Sorry, hold on. So a uh, spike alert for us is defined as, sorry, back up here one second. I'm gonna redo this for a second. So our spike alert system looks at the last retroactive or rolling 24 hours. And if it meets or exceeds a number that you've predetermined, then it will email you or notify you via text message that there is, an, uh, that there is a spike. Now, once it drops below that threshold, then that you will be notified that the spike is over. The, we have made an uh, algorithm that allows you to be uh, make a recommendation for what a spike should be in your area. However, you, don't have, you do not have to use that. So that's where that 90 days worth of data comes in that I mentioned a little bit ahead of myself. Um, and so our threshold recommendation is based on the last 90 days worth of data. And then if it is above two standard deviations, that's gonna be our recommended threshold. But you're able to make whatever threshold you would like and you can make as many spike alerts as you would like uh, for your area. And so what we have folks do is they'll make spike alerts for their neighboring counties. They'll make it along their known drug trafficking routes. Um, they'll set up multiple ones for their specific area. So if their recommended threshold is 10, they might say that's way too high. We want to know when it's five. And so every time you, that area reaches five overdoses within a 24 hour period, they'll get notified. So it allows area or it allows agencies to really expand how they can look at the data and create a notification system. Um, the cool thing about our spike alerts is unlike ODMAP, we have to be an approved user. You can add non-approved users to spike alert emails, but we do ask that it is not being sent out to the general public, to media, and that it really focuses on that need to know um, an example that I think people, um, that's a good example of uh, users that should be receiving spike alerts that maybe aren't eligible for ODMAP is going to be our like peer recovery specialists out in the field with harm reduction sites um, or community coalitions or um, folks at agencies that just need to know about spikes, but they're not going to use the map. So you can kind of build a system uh, and a user list for your spikes based on kind of what your area needs. But to set it up, you just go into the system and set up a, all of the information related to the spike alert. So you would decide your threshold. You can make your own custom email um, and what you want it to say. And then you would add your subscriber list. And then the alert would be initiated uh, once it meets those that information to so that threshold. Then you would uh, initiate a response. And that could be things like going back and checking ODMAP to see if um, those are, in fact, a related spike because it is based on sole numbers. So if you have five overdoses in your area and it triggers a spike, they might not be related. So you might see that two of them are an alcohol uh, related overdose event. You've got one fentanyl, one methamphetamine and one cocaine. It's less likely that they're related, but it's better to build in that response to go and check to make sure 
That way you can, you know, dispatch any sort of uh, response program that you have if you determine that they need to initiate that looking at the spike. Um, the system will also notify you if it the overdose it, spike lasts longer than 24 hours. And then once it drops below that threshold, so if you picked five, the second it drops down to four, it will end the spike alert for you and notify you via email. This is what the formats are. So on the left, you'll see kind of a basic template for the email. Uh, and then on the right, you'll see an example of the text message. We also wanted to create a layer that allows individual users to see where spikes are going on across the country. Again, we know everything is interconnected. And so being able to see where overdoses are, where spikes are occurring in the area could inform decisions that you're making on the day-to-day -day, or better understand if there's relationships to areas that you may not have known. And so uh, in our system, when you go to that little pancake looking layer button, um, you'll see an option now that says current overdose spikes. And if you turn that on, then you'll see every single overdose spike that is currently going on in the country. These are going to be based on our threshold recommendations just for consistency. And so you'll see an example here that uh, there is a spike right outside Metro Atlanta on this map um, near uh, near between Jacksonville. So on the um, Atlantic side of Florida, and then you'll see one in Baldwin County, Alabama. So that's going to be Mobile area, just, just for your reference. Um, but anytime you click on any of these, you would be able to see this pop-up button that allows you to get a little bit more information. So we see here when the spike started, the state and the county, we see the threshold that started, that triggered the uh, spike alert is listed as three. The number of incidents that have occurred was also three, and then the total number that occurred. So these are different in that the number of incidents is going to be the current number and then the total number. So if you currently have four in the spike, but seven have existed in the total spike over the extended period, you would get that differentiated, and then how long the spike has been uh, going on. So it was about six and a half hours. And then based on the timing of the spike of the, of the different cases, you'd be notified when we kind of anticipate that spike to end. We also wanted to make sure that there was a way to better understand when spikes were occurring in the last week. So we have created a similar layer to the current spikes. We call it the recent sp overdose spikes. And it's broken down into three different groups. So it's got zero to three days. That's going to be kind of your uh, dark terracotta, orangey brown color. And then this peach color is going to be your recent spikes from three to five days ago. And then your kind of beige color is your five to seven days ago. So as it get, fades to a lighter color, that means the further away it is. But when we go to areas like Atlanta, we can see that there was a there's a current spike. We had one a few days ago, and then we had one, uh, or we had one about a week ago, and then we had one within the last three to five days. So is there something coming in that area that maybe we need to be aware of? Is there a bad batch coming through? Um, is it something that's going to inform down, uh, is it something that's gonna impact this area here in Macon where you've had an overdose that occurred, or a spike that occurred in the last zero to three days? So uh, is there something going in this area because we know they're interconnected? And if not, then at least we have that option here to go and dig in and try to help answer questions and potentially go and reach out to partners in those different areas. That way you're better prepared. Um, we've also done some analysis to better understand how all of these are related. And we're always happy to do data projects for folks. Um, this is just an example of how you can track, how you can use the different spike alert tools along the East Coast um, here, because we know that our 95 corridor uh, carries our drug, drugs here on the uh, eastern side of the country. And so you're able to kind of map how all of these are related, again, just to better understand if you have activity in New York City and Philadelphia, how quickly is it gonna start impacting the Richmond area? And then even from there, how quickly is it gonna go uh, west out I-81 and start impacting more towards the Roanoke and Bristol area? We're able to kind of better understand how all of these are related due to when spikes are occurring and then matching those with the real-time overdoses as well using the dot side of the map. And then we also provide uh, resources on how to use our spike alerts and what they do. So we have our overdose spike response framework that kind of guides through if there is an overdose and recommended actions. Um, this was developed in a lot of partnerships across the country, including CDC, 
um, ASTO, NICHO, and a lot of our partners who use the inform uh, use ODMAP. And then we have our quick overview um, alert bulletin on what ODMAP does. So I want to end with, uh, before we go into questions, how people are using ODMAP in the field. Um, because ODMAP is meant to be a resource to help drive data to action. So it's being able to take that information that's occurring now and then use it to uh, either deploy current activities or hopefully help inform other activities that are going on. So an example of how we used a spike alert in the field, specifically in Virginia, um, happened a couple years ago when I was the public health analyst out of the overdose response strategy in Virginia. Um, my partner and I got a spike alert uh, for Arlington County on the 28th of June. And what we did, what happened was we reached out to our public safety and public health officials in the county. Um, it is pretty small. So we then we decided, you know, we want to reach out into our neighboring areas because we know that in Northern Virginia, everything is so transient that there, we wanted to see if it was impacting us or if we can inform regional efforts. And so by reaching out to those partners, me on the public health side and him on the public safety side, we found that this was a trend within the region, not just in our area specifically. And so we were able to kind of do some information sharing and better understand what we were looking at. Um, we were looking at a lethal batch of fentanyl in our area that was coming in as pills. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that we are focusing on resource heavy information getting out to the public because it was um, it was a fatal um, batch that we were seeing, which was unusual for us. Um, we saw 15 deaths in the area, in the region, six in Arlington alone. Our spike threshold is three, so it was a pretty bad week for us. Um, so what we did was we worked with our local coalition and our partners at RCSB to um, draft basically resources focused uh, statements. So what is our Good Samaritan law here, our local harm reduction effort, um, our information on where you can look at Narcan, and they decided to post some information on what they were looking at so that it was showing up in press pills. Um, and uh, they decided the best way to do this was put it out through the local coalition. So they posted it on Facebook, and this was something that got 400 times traffic, more traffic than usual, and they, uh, it, the, the CSB ran out of free Narcan for the weekend. So we found that to be a very successful uh, initiative and they continue to do this now. We've also seen ODMAP integrated into a spike alert response teams. Um, so they you know, take that information about a spike, spike response program and then match it with their local quick response team. So reaching out to individuals um, using their internal protocols. Um, we recommend those to always include, you know, public safety, public health, law enforcement, um, whatever works within your area, just bring them on. Um, and then you can use those spike thresholds to, you know, do whatever you'd like with it. But using those spike alert response teams are going to be really crucial to better reaching out and understand what's going on um, and making sure you're including the right partners is key. So uh, partnering with uh, maybe your non uh, ODMAP eligible entities like your harm reduction initiatives and things of that nature will be really crucial. And then we are also working on highlighting things uh, about what's going on in the field. So we understand we have uh, some idea about what's going on it within ODMAP and how folks are using it. So we really wanna highlight so that way others can know what folks are doing with it. So uh, we've recently launched, uh, relaunched our Spotlight series this year. Um, these are posted on our website, which has a ton of other resources like YouTube videos, training tutorials, overview pages. Um, but we have our Spotlight series here. Uh, we've included ones from West Virginia on their, how they're using it within their spike program. Uh, we have a example from North Florida um, that's actually being replicated out in Virginia. Um, they are basically taking any spike and then they're creating a bulletin and sending it out to local partners. Um, to provide understanding about what's going on. This is being replicated along um, a group of individuals in the I-81 area between Tennessee all the way through Maryland. Um, it includes our partners in the Bristol area, in Roanoke. We've got um, in, uh, missing one, um, the Winchester area. So along I-81 specifically, we are sending bulletins out that are being drafted by the public health analyst um, out of the overdose response strategy to better understand when spikes are occurring 
and sending them out to partners. Um, and then lastly, we have the Connecticut Department of Public Health, um, an example here. We've also got one we have ones from a uh, variety of law enforcement individuals, but we're always looking and trying to share information on how folks are using ODMAP um, and sharing those directly with our other partners. I think we have one coming up that will hopefully focus on how ODMAP can be integrated into overdose fatality review teams, which I know is part of the governor's initiatives recently to um, expand those. So ODMAP can be used uh, successfully within an OFR setting to help understand situationally what was going on during the time of an event that perhaps that area is looking at. So we're hopefully gonna have one of those here uh, shortly um, in addition to other resources that we have available. Um, so how to get started with ODMAP. So ODMAP, again, remember, is a free tool. You do not have to provide data to gain access to the system. Um, the only thing you have to do is sign up and then get approved. So to get started for ODMAP, um, you just want to determine if your agency is already an approved agency. Virginia has, I believe, uh, like 75 approved agencies, including the Department of Health um, and a variety of other different uh, state partners. So we always recommend checking to make sure your agency is, uh, if they're signed up or not. If they are, you just want to use your agency uh, agency code to sign up at odmap.hida.org as a new user. Um, I have my contact information in the next section. Uh, so if you're not sure or what your agency code is or who the person who would be in control of that agency account, you can always reach out to me and I can help you know. If they are not an approved agency, um, then you want to complete the uh, agency request form on our website. And then if you need to determine if you're an approved agency, you can always visit our website and look at our list of approved agencies, which is what you see over here. This is what you should see um, is you can select your state and then there'll be a list. Like I said, there's about 70 of all of the agencies and this means they're approved. And that is my uh, brief overview of ODMEC and uh, anything you can garner from it. Hopefully we will uh, bring more folks on and we're always happy to do additional tutorials if you'd like more in-depth detailed information on your specific area or doing a training for your agency. Um, that's me, I'm Allie, this is my contact information and I'll hand it uh, back over to uh, Jennifer and Tony to help facilitate any questions you might have in the chat or anything else you'd like me to add. Great. Thank you, Allie. Thank you so much for sharing ODMAP. It's an amazingly powerful tool. Um, I'm glad that the Opioid Abatement Authority brought you in to wrap up their 2023 Abatement um, Academy series. Thank you for sharing this information with us. Um, I have one chat right now um, and uh, one question in the chat right now, uh, and they were asking about what about ODs that go to the ER but not through EMS or the police department? Yeah, so that would primarily probably come from a hospital setting. Um, hospitals are eligible agencies and we do have several of them that are reporting. Uh, there's this unique, we would wanna work with them to see if it's uh, something where they would pull from their record management system or maybe partner with um, them to hand enter them. It's up to them, but they are able to be captured um, Governor DeSantis in Florida actually wrote a law that mandates the state of Florida to report all of those because we know that there are areas where it might be faster to, to bring someone to the ER directly than wait for EMS. And so we do acknowledge that and want to make sure people know that they can enter that information. In Virginia, there's just not that many hospitals currently signed up. Great. Well, that's our only question. Uh, Tony, do you want to have any final words? So, um, Again, Allie, thank you for, for making the presentation. You know, in Virginia, we have a number of resources that are starting to really come together. Uh, probably many of our attendees have heard of or may be familiar with the framework for addiction analysis and community transformation, or FACT, which is the state's data warehouse for opioid and addiction-related data. Um, you're able to layer that information and, and OD map together to provide uh, really valuable insights to define the problem. And of course, anytime you can define a problem, that's that half solves it. So we know that, um, again, the opioid crisis, the overdose crisis transcends community boundaries. And um, uh, and so the, the, and when we're working together in cooperative partnerships, working together regionally, this is incredibly valuable information that can help us save lives. 
And so I don't know if there's, maybe we can just ask one last time if there's any questions, if anybody wants to uh, ray, uh, put a question into the chat. <clears throat> Yep, we did have one come in. Is the OD map available in fact? No, it's not currently available. We partner, we partnered heavily with FACT for over three years, basically since I started. We've been working with them. We attend their monthly meetings. It currently does not connect uh, within the systems. Um, however, we do use the same EMS data source from the state so that the information should translate. And so we always say that they are complementary systems. So if you're looking at Virginia specifically and only want to focus on that, both systems will provide you that. Uh, FACT has more, more data set specific to, uh, to Virginia and outside of just suspected, opi opi uh, suspected overdose events. So they're a great way to deep dive into that and looking at those relationships. However, if you want to look outside um, the state, then we say ODMAP is a great way to look at that as well. Um, because it does provide uh, information across the country. So we are complementary systems and we work very closely together, but they currently do not overlap directly. Thank you again, everyone, for taking the time to join us today and um, wishing you all the best for a happy 2024.